everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Omni Channel Marketer. This is your host, Kate Stevens. Today, I am joined by Allison Kane, CEO and founder of Haven's Kitchen. We're so excited to have you. Welcome, Allison. Hi, thanks for having me, Kate. I'm excited. So I know that we both just got back from Expo West, so I'm going <laughs> a little bit off script here, but you know, tell me about like why you went to Expo West, you know, how is like that valuable to you as you think about it from, you know, a business perspective? Mm -hmm, for sure. No, I, um, I almost felt a little guilty, honestly, because I went to Expo West, but I didn't get a booth, but I went specifically to meet certain buyers. And, you know, I think a lot also like cheer on my brand friends or my friend brands. So I definitely had a little bit of guilt feeling talking to buyers without having got the booth. And then I kind of got over that. And then I was really there to support a lot of my friends and pop by and um, cheer everyone on. We're gonna be there next year. Hopefully if we can actually get a booth, they seem to be selling out pretty quickly. Um, wow. I think Expo in general is a lot of hype. I think it's really expensive if you don't have national distribution. I think a lot of brands make the mistake of going before they're actually able to fulfill orders from retailers because they feel like they should. And so I think it has mixed value, but like anything else, it's a tool and you can use the tool if you know how to use it really well, or it can like fall on your toe and hmm. give you a bruise, you know? So it's it's kind of like anything else. For us, it was very valuable. We had a couple of very key meetings. And also it was just great to see everyone in real life. I haven't been there since 2019 and meet some brands that, you know, meet people I've interviewed or, or, or you know, brands that we've done partnerships with. So it was really fun. I had a good time. I, I had a blast. I like had such a, such a you know, kind of buzz coming out of it just about the industry and everyone yeah. so completely relate to that. Backing up, why don't you, you know, start by just, you know, telling us a little bit more of, you know, your story and journey to founding Haven's Kitchen. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. I basically went back to get a degree in food systems and sustainability when I was around 40. I have five kids. They were all like under 10 at the time and basically decided that I was going to go back and do public health, which is what I was doing before I started raising all my kids. As a part of my master's program, I had to get an internship, which was sort of funny. And I ended up getting a job at uh, the education station at the Union Square Green Market. And I had always been teaching cooking in my house and to friends, but now I was also teaching agricultural systems and, you know, farm policy and things like that. And at the end of the day, what I really came out of that program with is that home cooking is sort of the most important and impactful lever a consumer can pull on for their personal health, their family, community, farm labor practices, environment, animal rights, all of it. People who are cooking at home are more connected to all of these issues and they just don't know how. And a lot of people knew this was 2010, 2011. People started making the connection between what they were eating and the environment, but they didn't know how to make rice that didn't stick and they weren't sure how to choose meat and everything was scary. So I opened a cooking school instead of doing public health in 2012. And it was not a professional culinary school. It was for home cooks who just wanted to like make a meal and feel good about it. And as a result of my students kind of saying to me, you know, the hardest part of the meal is the sauce and how come we're making this delicious chimichurri, but I can't seem to find it anywhere in the grocery store. And all of my options have like all this added sugar and preservatives and you know, can't you just make this and sell it? And so we started selling a couple of sauces out of the cooking school. And then we fortunately met, you know, people from Whole Foods and launched in 14 New York City Whole Foods and then went to the region and then launched nationally in 2020. And now, you know, the rest is history. So that's where we are today. <laughs> wow, that's like an incredible journey. It was really just an interest, you know, passion area on the cooking side that then translated into now, you know, what, what is a product and a brand? And so, you know, as you think about, you know, the state of the business today, what are some of the, you know, what are the, some of the focuses and, you know, growth opportunities for you now? 
Yeah. I mean, for us, you know, I, I have a brick and mortar brain, you know, like as, I mean, it's not hard to put my age together. So A, I have a very sort of like, I'm, you know, not young and, you know, wielding money around. Like I'm definitely like a little bit more frugal and I come from a brick and mortar business where like you didn't buy a new toilet if you didn't have, you know, sales. So Mm. the idea of building a company with bad margins and just assuming that if you grow it, you know, and just expand, expand, expand by paying for customers that aren't necessarily loyal, that never made sense to me as a model. I understand that it can work for tech. I don't know that it works for food. And so I was always sort of focused on profitability and margins and not expanding too quickly and not growth for growth's sake and all of that, which has had its assets and its liabilities, you know, for me. Um, And I would say right now it's looking more like an asset. That said, you know, a fresh business in the natural channel with some conventional isn't going to fill in, you know, if you have this brand and it's, it's this big shoe and then you have this fresh business that's doing really well for what it is, there's so much more we can do for home cooks. You know, we've never positioned ourselves as a fresh sauce company. It's always been about flavor shortcuts for home cooks, bringing, you know, global flavors to people's kitchens without intimidating them, making it really easy. Content that helps people cook from home, you know, with confidence and and joy. And so we are launching a new category in Q4 with a major retailer. It's very exciting to be doing something that's shelf stable. It gives us a home in the store that is kind of the same place in every store. It gives us opportunities to do end caps and displays and shippers and D2C and dot com. And, you know, there's a lot of um, fun stuff. So it's on one hand, you know, I'm still very much focused on like a sustainable, thoughtful business. On the other hand, I think there's a lot of growth opportunity this year and next year. That's really exciting. Yeah. Can't wait to hear more about that. So for our listeners that are less deep into the industry, what does a fresh product mean specifically? And, you know, how do you you know have to think about your distribution differently? Yeah, I mean, we are the the way that you can pasteurize something, the way that you can take, you know, chimichurri is chopped herbs, some olive oil, a couple of red pepper flakes, some capers, right? It's, you can make it right now at home. The way that we make it is essentially exactly the same way you would make it at home. And in order to get shelf life for that, that's beyond the three days that it would be fresh in your refrigerator at home, you can do a couple of things to it. You can heat it, You can add preservatives or you can apply pressure. So we use cold pressure, just like a cold pressed juice. We're just the first company to apply that to sauce. What that means is that we get, you know, at least four months of shelf life, which is great, but it also means that we need to be refrigerated from the minute that we're made all the way through till the end consumer, which is unusual for, you know, condiments and sauces. A lot of times you'll see you know, open, refrigerate after opening, or you'll see a shelf life of 12 to 18 months or something like that. So fresh means that it is cold chain from beginning to end. And that has, as you can imagine, a lot of challenges. Freight is expensive. Refrigerated freight is more expensive. Shelf life, you know, four months seems like a lot, not when you think about how long it takes to take it from production to the warehouse, from the warehouse to the store, you know, or to UNFI, from UNFI to then the store to then, you know. So it means that you have to be very, very careful about your supply and demand. Your demand plan has to be really, you know, tight. You don't want to overproduce and have spoils. You don't want to underproduce and not have enough to supply your customers and be out of stock. It's a more expensive, you know, more premium product, no question. And it's also, you know, more expensive to make. And we're proud of the fact that we've been able to do it as well as we have. And we've been able to, you know, bring in the audience that we have for it. So it sounds, you know, very clear that you are a retail first product. I, you know, I think both by your personal background and the way you thought about the business and then also by necessity. So, you know, 
what does omni-channel mean to you, you know, as, as a definition? How do you think about that being an omni-channel brand for your customers, both, you know, for your current product and then, you know, the way that you're thinking about your, your shelf-stable product that you'll be launch, launching in the future? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, the omni-channel is basically a way of saying that consumers aren't necessarily going to take the time or the effort or the energy to go find you where you are. Omnichannel to me means that you've got to be wherever they are looking for what they want. And, you know, that means not only on, you know, whether it's Amazon or Walmart.com or, Am or, you know, our own direct to consumer as one idea of a channel, but within grocery, it also means natural, conventional, mass, club. And then, you know, there's little nuances among them. You know, there's e -com, you know, the fresh directs of the world, the hungry roots of the world, the thrive markets. So I think of it as, you know, every different one of these sort of, you know, even for us, we're launching on Butcher Box, for example, next, next week. That's a subscription meat business. That's a channel, mm. you know, and so every different channel has a different objective in a way. Is this a distribution, you know, play? Is this a volume play? Is this a brand building exercise? You know, if the margin isn't particularly strong, is it a good, you know, sort of billboard marketing for the brand? I like to break things into channels and I like to have very clear objectives for each channel because they're not all built the same and you can't kind of evaluate them the same way. So maybe just taking a couple of your, of your channels and, you know, talking to me specifically about the objectives because I love that framework and I think that that's a, a really like thoughtful way to, to look at the different channels. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a really good example. One of the reasons why we're launching a shelf-stable product, you know, yes, within the grocery channel, you have natural and you have conventional. A fresh product like ours that doesn't really have a natural home, we can live in deli, we can live in the produce next to the salad dressings, we can live in the produce next to the vegan queso, we can live in dairy sometimes. Consumers aren't going hunting for us, right? They mm -hmm. want us to be in the same part of the store, whether they're going to Costco, to Target, to Walmart, to Whole Foods, or to the farmer's market store, right? That's on us to make sure that whatever channel they're shopping in, we are pretty consistent. That's very hard to do with fresh, but it's especially hard to do when you're kind of creating a new category like we did. So, you know, our job within those channels is to try to keep it consistent. So, you know, saying to a retailer, this is where we are at this retailer. This is where the consumer is used to looking for us. But now going into what we can't do really is it's very hard for us to have an Amazon channel. It's really hard for us to have a direct to consumer channel that makes any sense. So what's fun about having a shelf stable product is twofold. One is that within the store, there is as opposed to a four foot set where we live now, there's an 80 foot set or a 40 foot set. We're going to be in the same part of every store next to the same other brands, regardless of what channel we're in, which is really cool because it's an established category. And secondly, we get to expand into potentially having a D2C or an Amazon or, you know, other dot com channels that we couldn't before because they either didn't have fresh like a thrive market is just now launching fresh or because it was too expensive for us to have any sort of you know margin on that at all so how do you think about your website right now because i i know that you you know mentioned content is really important and i saw all the beautiful recipes yeah. and video content that you have on your website how do you think about that and how do you you know your customers learn about your website, given you don't currently sell D2C. You're going to love this because mm. <laughs> we've got a QR code. <laughs> I would say that for us, our website is not meant to act as a sales vehicle. We're not trying to get you to buy us. We're never sending out, you know, we have 
60,000 people on our email list and we have a 60% open rate. That's because people aren't getting sold stuff. It's because they're getting educated, right? We've always positioned ourselves, like I said, my DNA is teaching people how to cook. And that doesn't just mean how to make chicken. It means how to think about what to make, how to shop, how to like store it, how to save your time, how to have too, you know, not too much cleanup. All of that stuff is like content that we really feel good about providing to our, you know, our community. We have many more people coming to us to meal plan than are even buying the sauce because food content these days is either like buried in eight pages of SEO or behind a paywall or like super spawn conny, which doesn't really make any sense. So we see the website as our way of, you know, as almost like part of our product as opposed to selling our product. We also think that's a really good strategic position because we are kind of the only brand doing that in, in our space. And it's something that we really invest in, in terms of how we get people to go there. You know, we have 250,000 Pinterest followers. We're sending them to our website. There is a store locator on our website. If they're looking for us, more likely they're looking for tips and tricks or they're looking for, you know, ideas. They're looking for recipes. And oh, by the way, this chimichurri is really good. It's a, just a much more organic funnel for us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then in terms of, you know, one thing we're really proud of is on our pouches, you know, we have a QR code. That QR code takes you to a couple of different places, but one of the places is a filter system. So, okay, I'm buying this golden tahini. I, you know, what do I do with it? All right, I have chicken. I wanna make a one pot, 20 minute meal. I click chicken, tahini, 20 minutes, one pot. And out of 500 recipes, you have yours filtered for you. And then the next amazing part is that we can, we have videos for them all. We have obviously recipes for everything, but we also have a, like a shopping list that you can text to yourself from mm. the store so that you can just walk around and say, I need scallions, I need sesame seeds, I need, you know, whatever it is, chicken. So what we, we don't see it so much as like a funnel as much as a, a flywheel. You know, everyone's kind of, everything is supporting everything else. And I think going back to the idea of channels, right? It's, you know, the cool part about an ecosystem, going back to my like nerdy agriculture piece is like when you grow tomatoes and basil next to each other, the basil acts as a natural sort of repellent for pests. And, you know, the tomatoes have enough nitrogen that it, you know, fertilizes the basil. So you have two different channels, but ideally they're constantly supporting and feedbacking yep. with each other. That is, I love your description. It's a, you know, not a funnel, it's a flywheel. I think that we think very, I gotta credit um, Grace Clark on that. I have to say, oh, she said okay. it, I don't, yeah, I'm just, we're just gonna trademark <sighs> Grace Clark. <laughs> um, well, um, but I it stuck your... in my head when she said it, yeah. It's going to stick in my head too. So we're, we're going to yeah. see that one again. So Allison, what is, what is something that you feel, you know, bold or passionate about and why is that so important to you? I think, you know, again, coming from, I've been teaching for 25 years. I've been in the hospitality business for a decade. I think that the last several years, brands have been positioned as we are really cool if you use us or drink this or buy me, you can be part of our cool club. I've always been of the, you are the champion of this story and I'm just here to make your life a little easier. I'm really passionate about there actually being a problem that we are here to solve. And I think that when you are genuinely solving a problem you have a flow, you don't have to push so hard and you're actually creating value instead of something that the world doesn't really need. And I, I don't want to sound callous about it because my guess is that every founder believes that they're solving a problem. But I think, you know, the world has a lot of stuff and there's a lot of things vying for everyone's attention. And for a minute there, starting a CPG brand was like, what film school was in the nineties, you know, and it, it just, 
it's not it's not necessarily improving anyone's lives. And I think I'm, you know, every time I think about why we're doing this, you know, we're doing this to create careers for people. We're doing this to help people feel better about their lives. It's really tough out there. It's stressful. So dinner shouldn't be. Mm. And, you know, thinking about what to make for your brother-in-law who doesn't eat gluten shouldn't take up a day of your time. So when we live by those values and when we live by, you know, a, a certain amount of humility, you know, there's a hero's journey, right? You're the hero. We're not the hero here. And when we are really steadfast in that, I think everything just is really beautiful. So for, you know, especially earlier founders in the CPG industry that are wondering, okay, is this just like the long, hard journey that I'm on or, you know, that are questioning whether it's worth it? Like Mm -hmm. how, like, how do you think about, you know, giving them advice to think through, think through like, am I solving a real problem? I mean, I think there are a few things, you know, I think everyone's going through the, is this worth it? You know, it's been a rough couple of (laughs) God knows what's. I think number one, you know, assuming that there's going to be some amazing exit, assuming that, you know, your sales are going to go from zero to a billion, you know, any of those assumptions, you're going to run into this is not worth it because you're setting yourself up for disappointment and potentially disaster. You know, the goal really needs to be, especially now, building a profitable company. Food companies are very rarely profitable within the first couple of years. But if you aren't making a product that has at least a 40% gross margin out of the gate, don't assume that you're going to get to that margin with scale because it doesn't work that way. And don't assume you're going to get there with growth or that some VC is going to come in and and blow it up or someone's going to buy you and everything's going to be made whole. So I would say that's number one. In terms of am I really solving a problem, the best part of that is that that's just free. Go ask. Go ask people. You know, we did years of asking people in the cooking school before I even thought of a product. What? Why don't you cook? You know, why are you here? You know, what are you scared of making? What do you love to cook? Why did you come to a cooking class? You know, why did your friend have to drag you? You know, the more curious you are, the more you start to understand, like, where are the pain points? Because people don't know what their problem is. You know, they just know they have one, but they don't know how to verbalize it. So that's your job. And then once you have an actual following and there are people in your community, ask them why they like your product. Do they like it because, you know, it's pretty? Do they like it because it's gluten-free? Do they like it because, you know, it makes them feel good to use? Like, why? And then lean into that. And if there isn't a there there, you're probably going to know pretty quickly. And I think that's where people have to be really honest with themselves. And so the places that you're cultivating your community are Pinterest and your your email, email list primarily? Yeah, I mean, we also have like 50,000 TikTok followers. But, you know, TikTok to me is, I don't think of it as a community as much as it's awareness building and, you know, experimental you know, I, I do think it can lead to, oh, you know, sales, but you know, obviously that's hard to track. I don't know that that's community building. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, some people have built a really strong Instagram community. That's not as strong for us. Like we have, we have a nice sort of nice amount of engagement, but it's not our number one channel. We're also really, you know, working hard to build up YouTube content so that people can, you know, when you type into Google, how do I make chicken that isn't rubbery? We want to be close to the top and, you know, have a couple of recipe ideas. But I would say email is our strongest community. We also have a pretty strong SMS channel at this point too. And that's a very intimate group of people that really want to hear from you. They don't let you into their text messages if, if you're not giving them stuff that they, they appreciate. Yeah. Well, a 60% open rate on email is fantastic. So that is, that is very Yeah. Engaged. Thank you. Although I interviewed this woman from Clavio on my podcast and she was like, well, open rates are a little, I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> open rates are great. <laughs> um, she was like, it's really, there's this other metric. I'm like, yep, you know, that's fine. 
because we don't even sometimes have a click through. Like sometimes we don't have a CTA, you know, it's just here's it's something content. that might help you. It's mm -hmm. just content and it's just mm -hmm. building trust, you know? Absolutely. And, and awareness, brand awareness. I think that like the ability to be in someone's inbox and actually have that person open your content, then when they go to the grocery store, they, they know your brand um, yeah. and they're thinking of you in a way that you wouldn't have that awareness otherwise. So it's, it's a, yeah, you know, they it's remember. A mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, I mean, how many people see you on TikTok or see you wherever, you know, and buy you once like the, this game is all about velocity and repeat, right? Mm -hmm. You've already paid to acquire that consumer. So the more times they buy you, the less you pay for them. That's just the, you know, simple math, whichever yeah. channel you're, you're paying for them on. So, you know, the goal is to really have people who were like my head of marketing, her mother was at a grocery store in Queens the other day. And she saw someone putting two pouches, like one chimichurri, one miso at the checkout. And she like took a, <laughs> she like took a picture and she didn't want to like creep the, the woman out, but you know, she sent it to Courtney and she was like, this woman just bought two sauces, you know, at the same time. Like, that's, that's amazing. That's like, that's what we want. We want someone uh -huh. who comes in through chimichurri to then be like, I also love the gingery miso, or I use the chimichurri on my steak, but I can also use it on my eggs, you know? And that's our job is to keep that repeat and that, you know, excitement about it going. I love that. So moving into our lightning round. Yes. Favorite omni-channel brand? This is, I think, a little controversial because it's not food, but there's a clothing brand called Doen. And I thought about this question because I love the stores, great experience, but I also buy online all the time. And I also actually open their emails and read them. I think they're doing a great job on all three channels. Love that. Thing you <laughs> wish you could change about our industry? I love our industry. I, I do. I just, I wish that I've just seen booms and busts and I've seen, you know, fads and trends and I've seen things fly really close to the sun and then, you know, have a long way to fall. I, I wish that, I wish that it had been a little steadier and that it wasn't sort of, there wasn't this like mad influx in the last five or 10 years with, sort of insane money at insane valuations that just kind of put really good, slow and steady brands into a precarious position. Understandable. Yeah. Favorite podcast. I love Pivot. I listen to Kara and Scott pretty much every time they record. Amazing. I'll have to check that one out. Favorite <gasps> newsletter. Ooh, it's a good one. This is a little, this is, I, this is a new one for me. I really like Nate Rosen's. It's like, grocery express checkout. That's what it's called. Yeah. It's I, fantastic. Yeah. It's good. It's like a little, I open it, you know, that's, I read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite social media channel. So Pinterest isn't exactly social media, but it's one of my favorite all time inventions because it has all of the good stuff of social media, idea sharing, and community without the FOMO and the look at me, look at me, look at me, and the you've got to, you know, look at me. Yeah. So I, I love Pinterest. Favorite book? I'm rereading Just Kids by Patti Smith, and I remember why it was my favorite book when I read it. What's it about? So Patti Smith and Robert Maplethorpe, it's, you know, 70s New York City, you know, rock and roll, art, gritty hippie, amazing. Just, cool. you know, New York. And then favorite event that you're planning on going to this year? We are actually hosting an event for another founder from the West Coast who is one of my very good friends. And we're doing like a little East West Coast party Fun. at our office. So I'm really excited for that. I like being able to leave early and <laughs> I, I go to bed pretty early. And then where can people connect with you? Probably LinkedIn is the best. That's, I don't have any other social channels. If they're interested, obviously in Haven's Kitchen, we have a pretty amazing website at havenskitchen.com. If they want to connect with me, I'm just me on LinkedIn. 
Amazing. Allison, thank you so much for your time. I love this conversation. Uh, Thanks for having me, Kate. It was fun. If you liked this podcast, follow me and The Bridge page on LinkedIn and Twitter for hot takes and tactical advice. If you really loved today's episode, we'd love a review on the podcasting platform of your choice, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening.